Good morning, would you please rise to sing our first worship song? to worship at St. James this morning. Great to be here. Great to have the Arctic blast gone and to be here. Could we just take a moment and uh, turn around and tell people, how did you survive that Arctic blast? And uh, say hello. How did you, what did you do? Did you stay inside? You, you made soup. Good, good. Do you guys have a fireplace? We do. I made a fire. Okay, good. You ready with the announcements? Great, good, good. Uh, uh, please be seated for some announcements. Uh, by the way, a special welcome to visitors and guests today. We have uh, Alex and Jess here. By the way, recently engaged, so uh, you want to make sure. Yes, hello. And. Uh, uh, with, with just his mom and dad here, I think they're probably checking out the venue, you know, that's good, that's good. But we're very glad to have them here. And Tracy, you have come back. We're so pleased. Yeah. Yay! Yay. Amen. Woo. We're, we're excited about everybody, but I've got to tell you, it's very excited. What, what, are, what answers have we got here? Yes, Pastor. Uh, on Sunday, today, February 5th, there will be a congre congregational meeting, almost... Yeah, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Kyle. You, you're mm. a, a all right. Meeting. Congregational meeting. Uh, we could really 
go into a different direction on what I was about to say, to discuss the potential purchase of a residential property right next door. The giving tree is set up. Wait, out wait, wait, more, more about that, by the way. Yeah, um, please, yeah, faster. So, um, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that could happen to, that would just end this. Like some other buyer, you know, slips in and says, oh, whatever the church is, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll give more of that. You know, it would end it. This has not happened. It's still a very live thing. And today, so we're going to discuss this at the meeting after today's worship service. Uh, but between 11 and 30 and 12, we've arranged, you can go over and walk around in that house. Kick the tires or whatever you do to a house. And um, so that's available. Let's go on with the next announcement. Yes, yes. The Giving Tree is set up out in the narthex uh, to help support Mercy Center Ministries and the Sienna House. Please make your donations by February 19th by placing them in the plastic bin underneath the table where the Giving Tree is located. Right out there, please see the bulletin for further details on items that are needed. Please update your information in our church direction app, church directory app. Miss please, Print. Please put your eyeglasses on. It, no. no. <laughs> look. Look. Oh, Direct, okay. yeah, yeah. Church directory. <laughs> For members only. Today, Luann will be available in the parish hall. Luann. To assist to anyone that needs assistance. Other than that, have a blessed Sunday, everybody. I, I should also mention this, by the way. My phone died. Yet last night, it, so uh, p if people are phoning me, giving me texts, it's not happening. It's not happening. I, so if you think, he, why doesn't the pastor pick up or respond? I have no phone, and I, I don't, I, I'm so technologically inept, I don't even know where to get one from. But uh, we'll, do, do, do they have them at Lowe's? Do they have them at Lowe's? No. I'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Good. God is, God is here. You know, he, he, he's, he's in the house, and he's here to impart his love, to assure us of forgiveness and go on from there to impart his love and power to us. It's a kingdom thing God's here to do. Let's in, invoke his kingdom in our midst, in our lives now. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Youngsters, would you please come down for the Sunday school opening? <coughs> Come on down. Here we go. Including Mrs. Johansson. Hi, guys. Good. Coming down. Okay, great. I wonder if the kids always sit in the same spot, kind of like their pew. Do they do that? I don't know. Some of them do. <laughs> guys, it's so lovely to see you this morning. And as per usual, Desi has gone back. <laughs> All right, guys, have you ever been to a store where they give you free samples? Like, have you been to Costco? Yes. And sometimes there's those people there who like to give you a little taste of something, right? To try it. If you don't like it, do you buy it? No. no. Has to taste good, right? And then you go, mom, 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 buy it, buy it, buy it. <laughs> right? A whole pallet of it from Costco. Yes. Well, today we're going to do a little taste test. Now, to help me, I'm going to get Cole Schmidler up here. Cole, come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, Cole Schmidler, yes. <laughs> Morning, Cole. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get you a microphone. All right. So, come on here. Is it on? Yes. Oh. Check, check. Oh dear, oh dear. Check, check. Okay. So, Cole, I have two sets of crackers here. One has salt on it and one doesn't. I would like you to taste test which one you like better. So first of all is the salted, no, we'll go with the unsalted. Unsalted first, okay? What do you think? It's kind of dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a cracker. Okay. <laughs> Now try this one. Mm, this one's good. Okay. <laughs> this is the one with the salt on it, right? Okay, so salt tastes better on crackers. What about popcorn? Oh, yes. <laughs> Think you know the answer, right? Okay, non-salted popcorn. What do you think? It's okay. It's okay. All right, all right. Salted. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> One more? <laughs> okay, good. 
Thank you, Cole. Great job. Oh, do you want some water? I got water for you. Okay. <laughs> Right. It's, it's salt water. <laughs> yeah. So kids, here's the thing. Salt makes things taste better, right? Sometimes a recipe calls for just a pinch of salt, and that pinch of salt makes all the difference to how it tastes. Even cake, sometimes they call for a little bit of salt just to enhance the flavor of it. Now that popcorn without the salt, it tastes like nothing. It's like eating cardboard or something. It just does not taste good, right? So in the Bible story today, Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. So he must be saying that to us too. What does Jesus mean when he says that? Let me tell you. Jesus means that salt makes life taste good and you have the love of God in you, just like Jesus, and you have Jesus with you, and that is like what makes you salty. You make life, Jesus makes life tasty. Jesus makes life better. And because you have Jesus in you, you can go out there and make life better for other people. It's like sprinkling you around. You're like salt that we sprinkle They're like sprinkled around. in their classrooms. Yeah, doing good at home, doing good at school, just doing nice things for people being salty in the earth. So in your classroom today, I have left you all some samples so you can try non-salted and salted, okay? Okay, good. All right, we're gonna do a song about that love of Jesus right now. I think we know this one. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. Let's see, yeah, you were finished this, this morning. All right. Are we can I tell them the actions? We don't know them? But they might know them. Okay. So it goes, it's so high you can't get over it, so low you can't get under it, so wide you can't get around it, but don't hit the person in the face next to you. <laughs> oh, wonderful love. We so let's be, stand up. We should be singing the love of Jesus is so salty, but that's yeah. actually not the words. Okay, here we go. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. Oh, wonderful love. How high? So high. So wonderful, oh wonderful. How high is this love? So high, you can't get over it. So low, you can't get under it. So high, you can't get around it. Oh wonderful love. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Because I tidy my room. Pastor, no, it says because he died what? for me. What? Well, won't tidying my room, like even making the bed, won't that get me into heaven? No. Well, well then, then why will I go to heaven? Because he died for me. Oh, okay. Then, then one, one day, day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Because I share my m and No. Kids, we're going to have to correct what you here. It's you. <laughs> I didn't think that my singing was that bad. Well, won't, won't, uh, won't sharing my M&Ms, won't that get me into heaven? No. It, what if I share them all, even the red ones? I love the red ones. What if I share those two? No. Then why will I go to heaven? Because he died for me. Oh. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Because I eat my green beans. Uh, well, come on. I won't eat my green beans and broccoli and turnips. Uh, well, well, won't that get me into heaven? No. Okay, now I'm listening. Why, why, why will I go to heaven? Because he died for me. He, he, he died for me? Yeah. That's a lot of love. Okay, now I got it. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to heaven. Then one day I'll go to hell because he died for me. Got it? So high, you can't get over it. So low, you can't get under it. So high, you can't get around it. Oh, wonderful. Yay. Nice to you, kids. Pastor Bundy, guys. 
<laughs> yes? Everyone, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer as the family of God here. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Great. Off we go. Everyone else, would you please rise and we will continue with our worship with song. Oops. <laughs> Things of interest. Seated. The epistle reading for this morning is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise to hear our Lord speak to us in the gospel. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 19th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of, of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's <coughs> wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, therefore a, man, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We'll continue now with the prayer of the day as found in your bulletin. Lord Jesus, you are the bridegroom who greatly rejoices over us, your bride, the church. You're unshakably committed to us and more. You're totally faithful to us and more. You're not just a great provider. You actually love and enjoy us. You're glad to be united to your bride. And you rejoice in intimacy with us. You haven't discovered something recently that makes you wonder what you were thinking when you chose us. Lord, if your commitment, passion, and affection for us were not written down so clearly in your word, we'd never believe it was true or even possible. Continue to free us from our unbelief and underbelief. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> there are some key terms we need to be clear on if uh, we're going to benefit from the sermon this morning. And the first up would be the word gospel. The word gospel means literally good news. You say, okay, what good news? It's very specific good news. The gospel is a specific message. <laughs> Now, I'm not talking about the four Gospels, right? The Gospels, the, 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 those books of the New Testament which serve as a biographies of Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of John. You know, we, from them we get our Gospel reading every week in uh, worship. Now, I, I'm sure people get confused about this. Nevertheless, the Gospel is not the same as the four Gospels. But there is a connection. Those four books about Jesus declare and portray a specific message, which is this. The good news of God's passionate and sacrificial love for his people. God's passionate and sacrificial love for his people. That's the gospel. <laughs> passionate? How so? Well, I think you all know something about passionate love. Well, <clears throat> God has that for you. And for all his people, not a mild, not a disinterested love, not a platonic love, a passionate love. And the gospel says <coughs> that his love is sacrificial, meaning that God loves you and he loves his church so much that he sacrificed himself for us, literally laid down his own life to pay for, cleanse, free, and save us. Probably more than one person has told you they love you, and likely they do. But have they ever sacrificed themselves for you? T to what extent? H have you ever had anyone literally lay down their life to save yours? That would be such an amazing love. And the message of the gospel is, God in Jesus Christ did that for you and has that love for you. He has an amazing, passionate and sacrificial love for his people. 
The surprising message of love is written not only in the Bible and in the four gospels particularly, but God has written it additionally within our sexuality. What, what did he just say? You heard right. I said sexuality. I'm going to be talking about this. So this ought to be an interesting sermon. <laughs> Within our sexuality, God has written the gospel. That's obviously going to require some explanation. Okay, but before I wade in, there are a couple other terms along with gospel I need you to be clear on. One of them is bride of Christ. You say, Christ is a bride? I thought he was single and never married. Actually, there are quite a few references in the New Testament to the bride of Christ, and every time it's a reference to the church. You see, the church is not just a building or a sort of religious business or a, a fan club for God. The reality is way deeper than that. The truth is there is a mystical reality to the church. The church, meaning the people of God together, is the bride of Christ whom the bridegroom, that's Jesus, loves passionately and for whom he sacrificially gave up his life only three days later to then rise from the dead so that he now lives and can live intimately and eternally with his beloved bride and she with him. And the amazing fact is the reason you and I and all people have sexuality. The reason God designed people, you know that God intentionally designed people, right? To be sexual beings with exciting sexual desires and sexual expression. The reason, not the only reason, but the main reason for all that is so that we would have a way as humans somehow to grasp and imagine the love of God, the mind-blowing fact of Christ's passionate, sacrificial, and intimate love for his church, of which you and I are members. Human sexuality points to something far greater and far deeper than itself. And listen, I realize that uh, every adult here uh, figures they've had a thorough education regarding sexuality, and they know all there reasonably is to know about it, and yet they've never heard anything like what I just said. Why would that be? Because for decades and decades, our culture has attempted to understand and practice sex without reference to God. God is out from this area, frankly, even among Christians, as though he's got nothing to do with sexuality. And that leaves an enormous blank spot in our understanding since God actually designed everything about sexuality. It's not going to be possible to understand or practice it meaningfully without him. Yet that's basically what our culture has set out bravely to do. But it just keeps experiencing more and more emptiness. Their, their solution is, well, we're experiencing more and more emptiness because we need, have even, we need even more and more sex and more, you know. And they go, you know what, it's, it's not, that same direction is not going to result finally in fulfillment. More about God's beautiful design in a moment because there's still one more term we've got to understand if today's message is going to be of any help and it is the word covenant. A covenant describes a certain kind of relationship. It's actually the basis of a certain kind of relationship. Now, most relationships are not covenantal. They're contractual. I'm going to explain these terms. E even if there is a written Rather, even if there is not a written contract, most relationships, one way or another, operate on kind of a contractual basis. Meaning, I'm in this relationship for what I can get, and you're in it for what you can get, and as long as the needs and expectations of both parties are being met, we've got a relationship. This is always how business relationships are. It's the kind of relationship you have, for example, with Lowe's. Lowe's. Uh, I'm talking about the big DIY and lumber store. I, and I also realize the only reason, I, it's the only store I ever go to, so it's my last example. <laughs> but here we go. As long as Lowe's provides the product you want at the price you want, you go there. You get the product, Lowe's gets your money. It's a consumer-vendor relationship. 
But it's not like you're committed to going to Lowe's no matter what. In fact, if they have a better product over at Home Depot or the same product at a better price, it's goodbye to Lowe's, you're out. It doesn't matter if you've got a friendship with the sales guy in aisle nine, because it's all about your needs. And if they're being better met at Home Depot, you're gone. I'm saying that the consumer vendor relationship, also called contractual, is by far how most relationships are structured, including, in our modern times, love relationships. Let's say I'm romantically involved with you. What's that based on in today's thinking? It's based on how you make me feel. And you're in it for how I make you feel. If these good vibrations lessen or stop, I'm out and off to somebody else, like going off to Home Depot for a better deal. And this is where, in current thinking, sexuality fits in. <laughs> it is conceived simply as a commodity, a commodity that makes you feel good. You try and get the best quality thrills you can at the least cost to yourself. And if you're not happy with the sex, you move on. It's a consumer vendor thinking. One of the most eye-opening things that the Bible teaches is that there's another way. It's a different basis for your love relationship, and it's called covenantal. What does that mean? When a covenant relationship is made, it's not the needs and desires of either party that are preeminent. It's the existence and health of the relationship itself that is most important, okay? So in a covenantal relationship, I'm going to put my needs and desires second, and even sacrifice them, if that's going to protect and preserve the relationship. The most precious thing is the relationship itself, not my needs and desires. So, for illustrative purposes only, but say I had a covenantal relationship <laughs> with Lowe's, which I don't, and it wouldn't be appropriate, but if I did, <coughs> then I would shop at Lowe's no matter what no matter how much it cost me. The important thing would be that I'm at Lowe's, not how much money I'm saving or spending. The relationship itself is the important thing. And if Lowe's was in such a relationship, uh, what would they do? They'd, they'd, they'd come around in a truck to pick me up and take me to the store. And when I'd get there, they'd surround me with help week after week, surrounded by help, even if I never bought a thing. It's a covenantal relationship. They just want to be with me and take care of me, and I just want to be with them. Now, obviously, this is a silly illustration because there's no such thing as a covenantal business relationship. But there is such a thing when it comes to people, and there is such a thing when it comes to God. The most famous and oft-repeated verse from the Old Testament, Exodus 34, verse 6, goes like this. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. What does this mean? God is saying that his love for his people is not contractual. He's, it's not on a consumer vendor basis, so that if his people let him down, he's going to quit on them. Rather, the Lord's love for his people is steadfast and faithful. When he's disappointed, even badly disappointed, he's not going shopping somewhere else. He's not looking around for someone else because he abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. He abounds in it. The relationship he has with his people, that's the preeminent thing. In love, God will do whatever he has to do to protect that relationship and cause it to thrive. And you see that above all, amazingly, in Jesus Christ. Because it's people who sin, right? It's people who've sinned and by their sins who've alienated and wrecked their relationship with God. God doesn't walk away. In Christ, he works to restore that relationship. And Jesus took all, the, he'll do anything. He, he took all our sins, all those sins and, the, and their consequences, and he took them upon himself. He, he set aside his own needs and desires. I mean, he wanted to live like anybody. But he died. He sacrificed himself on the cross in order that the relationship with us could be brought back to life. 
This is no contractual love. God's love is covenantal. And marriage was created for people in order to mirror God's covenantal love. And so it asks that we commit to steadfast love and faithfulness, you know, in sickness and in health, for richer or for poor, for better or for worse, till death. This kind of love is not a feeling or a good, 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 good vibration. But it's a promise. When you make wedding vows, Alex and Jess, when you make wedding vows, a covenant with your spouse, you are committing to, to continue to choose love even when it costs, even when you must sacrifice. Now, the modern world does not get this. It even shuns the idea of commitment. Nonetheless, the way God has put the universe together, in losing yourself, you find yourself. In giving your life, you build a new one. And it is precisely this connection between God's covenant love and marriage, as God intended it, that Paul is on about in our reading from Ephesians 5. He says there that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And in the same way, husbands should love their wives. A word that summarizes this is sacrifice. Husbands, sacrifice yourselves for your wives with your needs and desires second. And by the way, a few verses earlier, Paul had written the famous words, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, which means exactly the same thing. Sacrifice your needs and desires to the greater good of the relationship. Oh, people raised in this present world, this is not a consumer vendor model. It is how Christ is toward his bride, the church, and he is the basis for everything that has to do with true love. Sacrificial and more. It is a passionate love that's being described in Ephesians 5. Paul shows that by quoting from Genesis chapter 2, which our Lord also quoted in the gospel reading we had. But it says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Two becoming one flesh. That's talking about sex. God designed it and he ordained it for marriage. This fiery, exciting, passionate expression of love. Sex. And then, hold on to your hats. Paul says this in Ephesians 5.32. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Yes, the oneness, the fiery, exciting, passionate expression of love. This is what Christ has for his bride. And looking for his church to show to him, show me some love, church. I love you. And what couples can begin to experience in their marriage when it's going right gives them a glimpse of the sort of love that God has all the time for them. He's not imitating us. We, if it's true love, are mirroring him. Hooking up, sleeping around, easy divorce. God did not create us for the shallowness and pain of contractual love, which is now the norm in our society. We were created for deep, rich, faithful covenant. That love is the real deal. Covenant love is the beautiful, nurturing environment, the place for the two to become one flesh in a passionate embrace. Indeed, it's the only place for this. Why? Well, because what's marriage? God's word teaches that marriage is a covenantal commitment to totally give of yourself to the other. Think of how Christ gave himself for the church. Did he hold anything back? Think of how Christ gave himself for the church. Husband and wife mirror that, vowing to give themselves to the other in every way, socially, emotionally, financially, legally, you name it. In covenant love, the two become one. And sex is the fiery, passionate celebration and renewal of that oneness. Sex is the expression with your body 
of the self-giving you've committed to with every other part of your life. Which is why sex outside of marriage, outside of that covenant, is so contrary to God's plan. Because that is the giving of your body when all the other has not been committed to. And it hasn't been committed to, it's not there. Really, all sex outside of marriage, it's just mere taking. It's, it, it's mere taking. It's taking what's precious from the other without the commitment to give everything of yourself. Truthfully, outside of marriage, sex is merely a consumer vendor commodity. But the thing is, you are not a mere commodity. You're not a mere thing on the shelf for somebody else. You are not that. You are infinitely more than that, and so is the other person. You are someone who is loved by Christ and called now to truly love like him. Friend, God has got so much more for you than the contractual thing, the contractual travesty our society waves around and calls love. Amen. But you would think from the way that Christianity and the church are often belittled in the media, belittled on practically every entertainment venue there is, you'd think from that that the gospel of Christ was supposed to be repressive, that the gospel is opposed to sexual desire. Hardly. The fact is, God designed our hearts and bodies to be sexually awakened. Our sexual desire, including all the emotions and dreams that it encompasses, can become so strong and persistent in a young man or woman that they can hardly concentrate. <clears throat> this is not bad. I believe it's God's reminder that we were created for covenant. Do you see this? Because of sexual desire, a young man will suspend his pursuit of the perfect job to pursue a woman. The chemicals of falling in love may compel them both to put everything else as secondary so that the relationship is going first. The bodies God designed for them invite them to love, to the passion and to the sacrifice of covenantal love of marriage. Which is why I said earlier in this message that within our sexuality, God has written the gospel. I feel like I'm a little voice crying into the hurricane of our culture. But you know what? It's God's truth. The Holy Spirit's in it. I cry on. Maybe I've convinced you. Hopefully I've at least got you thinking that by God's design, sexuality is mysteriously linked to the message of God's passion and unfailing love for his people. Our bodies tell the story of covenant love, the longing for it, the celebration of it as well as the devastation of broken covenant, by which I mean unfaithfulness, cheating. It is devastating. And now you understand why. Because our very beings were designed for better. We were made for steadfast love and faithfulness. So much sexual sin, though. So much unfaithfulness and brokenness. I'm sure there are people listening to this who are feeling convicted now and low. But here is the great promise of the gospel. While we have sinned and broken our covenant with God, he will never break his with us. <laughs> Christ. Christ remains steadfast in his love. Though we are faithless, he remains faithful, committed passionately, to the relationship and the restoration of the relationship with you. And so there's forgiveness for you in the sacrifice of Jesus. In his blood is cleansing for every stain. And there is for you now a new and better life in communion, in intimacy with him who rose from the dead. Deeper in Jesus is your direction now. You were created for covenant. Amen. And now, may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting.
Amen. Would you please rise? And let's confess our faith that the word of God teaches us in this summary of God's key teachings called the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with the prayer of the church. For the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs, let us bow our heads together and let us pray. Lord God, help us to not seek our identities through our accomplishments and relationships or to judge ourselves by earthly standards. Instead, we pray that you help us to see ourselves as you see us perfectly created, chosen, redeemed, forgiven, grace lavished, unconditionally loved, and fully accepted by you forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, you have created each of us with unique and special gifts. We ask that all your children be united in worshiping you and that we be guided to work together to use our different talents to further your kingdom and to spread your holy word. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your guidance in matters of hiring a DCE, a Director of Christian Education, and the purchase of a home for staff to live in. Help us to make good decisions in accordance with your will for our congregation. You alone can see the entire picture of our lives and consequences of each of our decisions. You alone know what choices should be made and in what time they should be done. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Most gracious God, we pray for the saints at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Glendale that the church be a beacon of hope, a refuge for the weary, and a place where all can experience your grace. May all of us become instruments of your peace and embodiments of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, cause healing to spring up speedily for the sake of your Son. Have mercy upon those who suffer afflictions of sin in mind and body, including Elmer Middlestadt, who underwent back surgery this past week and who is now in the process of recovering. John Gobbler, who is continuing to recover from head injuries he sustained. Rosemarie Santop, who suffered a fall last week. Bonnie Spiegel's friend, Dr. Michael Matilski, recovering from a second heart surgery. Bob Pizibilski, who is back in the hospital due to medical issues with his leg. And a prayer of thanks for safe delivery of a healthy baby boy for Eileen and Carl Wagner's daughter, Danielle, and husband, Kyle. And those we now name before you, aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Preserve your people in faith until the day when your light breaks forth like, a, like the dawn, providing healing and restoration according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You know, God is in this close relationship with his church, of which we're all members. 
like a like a groom, a, a husband, uh, and he prov- he pledges his support and his love in everything. He's he's faithful and a wonderful provider. And we're in this relationship with him. He looks to us to respond, to, to notice his great um, and generous uh, love and support for us, to respond. And, and one way we do that in worship is with our offering. We notice, your God, you, and we want to use our offering to participate in the work of your church. Um, it's, that, it's a relationship. It's a relational giving. The two are one. Everything we have from him is in the we have is from him in the first place. We're just giving back. Let's put it all in the for God's feet. You know that's how it is. We give receive our offering here at St. James out in a plate out in the narthex, or we give electronically. But let's join together now as the church and pray to God with the offertory prayer. <laughs> Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let's, um, let's offload what has uh, bad things that have worked into the relationship between us and God and us and others and uh, confess them. So we could we please kneel to confess to God our need for mercy. God of glory, you sent Jesus among us as the light of the world to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our pride often acts like an eclipse, locking your light, presence, and will from us. And so we have not loved you passionately. Neither has we loved our neighbors as ourselves. In doing good, we don't go beyond what's convenient. We've lived as though our desires are what it's mostly about. We're put in the gloom by our sin. Turn to us in grace, forgive us our sins, and renew us in union with Jesus, the true light, so that we may truly live and show forth your glory. God's mercy and grace are steadfast. They do not run out. He has given his only son to be the perfect man on behalf of you and everyone and to be the perfect sacrifice, cleansing away your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. (laughs) In this sacrament, Christ has ordained something for us extraordinary. His, his body and blood. I mean, this is very passionate language. It is. His, his body and blood, not just symbolically, really but mysteriously present in and with and under the bread and wine. And he includes with that these words, it's for you. And it's for the forgiveness of sins. It's for Everything that you may know he's restored the relationship with you and wants to continue with you, in you, intimately with you. It's, it's wow. Let's come to the Lord's table to have holy communion, rejoicing in his covenantal love. You know, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Let's hear him and come to the table in faith this day. The Lord be with you. And also you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you've made known to the nations in your Son. In him, 
being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you've manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Body of Christ, given for you. This is the very 
body of Jesus given for you. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. God bless you. He loves you. He is with you. Just be strengthened in him. Amen. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the very body of Christ given for you. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Jesus given in love for you. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Jesus given for you. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. This is the very body of Jesus given for you. God bless you. Jesus loves you. He is passionate about you and so strong. Find your strength in him. Amen. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Jesus given for you. rise. We'll sing the song after communion, the song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Uh, reminder that we have um, the cafe downstairs. Even though there is a congregational meeting coming up, that's after the cafe. Tracy, how long has it been since you've had a coffee and a cookie down there? It's, it's, okay. okay, good. And, uh, and, every, and everybody um, remember to uh, shake uh, Alex and Jess's hand too and congratulate them. But good, let's, um, let's sing together our closing song.
and they'll 